thank you to everyone for joining today, our second Calling All Women and Allies virtual convening. This, as I said, is the second in a series of bi-weekly convenings. So please register uh, and visit at www.itstimenetwork.org backslash calling all women if you'd like to register for upcoming calls. And if you'd like to present on an upcoming call, please send an email to kate at itstimenetwork.org following this call. Uh, all of those um, URLs are in the chat box below. So whenever we mention a chat, um, I mean a uh, URL will be in the chat box, so you can just have a look there. So my name is Betsy McKinney, and I'm the founder and CEO of It's Time Network. I'm joined today by several members of It's Time Network's team, as well as Jessica Stender. Uh, Jessica is the Senior Staff Attorney at Equal Rights Advocates, or ERA, as they are known here in San Francisco. Equal Rights Advocates is part of our local advisory council here in San Francisco, which is part of our Network City program, and we'll be telling you more about that in just a moment. And Jessica will be telling you more about the work at ERA after I'm finished. Before we get started, we have a couple of quick notes about the call. The first half of the call will be presentations, and then the final half, we will have question and answers. So feel free to type any questions you might have into the Q&A box down below as they come up for you during the presentations, so you don't have to wait till the end. Whenever I mention the link, as I said, we'll share it in the chat box, so be sure to check there, and if Jessica mentions links. We will also be emailing a recording of this call in case you'd like to review the information or if you want to share it with others. So first, before we hear from Jessica, I want to share a bit about It's Time Network's mission and our work with you. It's Time Network is a growing network of individuals and organizations who are working collaboratively to accelerate gender equality. We're building an infrastructure for collective action and impact city by city, so we can work together across issue areas silos for systemic change. We want to advance common agendas for gender equality in all of our communities. As we work to protect and advance the rights of women and girls, it's important to recognize that we live in an increasingly insecure and polarized world, and reaching out across divides is essential in the work ahead, along with recognizing that all of the issues we face in our world today are interdependent and connected. So we recognize that in order to achieve a world that works for all people and all life, women must now reach a new level of collective activism and leadership. As individual women, we know we're transforming our families and our communities every day in big and small ways. Our individual women's organizations are tackling tough local, national, and global issues. And women are active in all areas, from women's rights, to racial and social justice, economic inequality, environment, poverty, global security, and more. You name it, women are already engaged in and working to fix the problems we face. And yet, we have not yet built a national infrastructure to support the important collective action that now needs to take place. So at a time when divides seem to be growing, even between women, and when we still seem so far away from achieving gender equity, we ask ourselves here at It's Time Network, can we build upon the connections between us, across nations, across political parties, across religion, race, and class, can we find common values and build our capacity for collective action? That's what we're building here at It's Time Network, so we're really pleased that you're joining us today. And and we have a slide, um, not a slide, sorry, a, a video presentation about what collective impact is and why it is so effective and why we use it as the basis of the work that we do here at It's Time Network. The number and complexity of challenges facing our world can be overwhelming. 
when individual organizations attempt to tackle the most daunting problems, success stories are all too rare. Many innovative approaches have been tried, too few have worked. However, when organizations work together under the right conditions, they can accomplish great things. One particularly effective means of collaboration is collective impact. Using the collective impact approach, a number of complex social challenges have been addressed and some remarkable results have been achieved. Youth incarcerations dropped by 45% in just three years with no change in public safety, improving the lives of thousands of youths. 6,000 public housing residents were placed in new jobs during the recession. More than 1,000 acres were restored and over 280 million pounds of pollution voluntarily reduced to conserve and restore a river. Organizations utilizing a collective impact approach do the following. Agree to a common goal. Agree to track progress in the same way, which allows for continuous improvement. Do what each does best while identifying new ways to work together. Have consistent communication. And finally, have skilled and dedicated resources to support ongoing efforts. The world's toughest challenges aren't going away. In fact, many experts predict they will continue to grow in both number and complexity. Solving these problems requires a range of expertise from a number of diverse organizations. Collective impact is a proven approach, helping organizations work together to move mountains. So each component of collective impact has associated tools that help build the necessary supportive, what's called backbone infrastructure to achieve collective impact. So at It's Time Network, we've developed a structure that facilitates collective impact starting at the city level. And we do this through our Network City Program, which establishes local advisory councils, with diverse women leaders from across all sectors in each city. The local advisory council then begins to assess the status of women and girls in their area, and then creates collective impact projects with member organizations in the network to address the most pressing needs. The network grows by inviting more individuals and organizations into the network in each city so that more and more of us city by city are informed and engaged in the changes that we want to make in our own communities. So we're currently piloting the program in San Francisco and Denver, and we are ready to take it to scale in 2018. As more cities become part of the network, our capacity for collective action begins to scale from the city level to the state to the national and then beyond. Right now, the local advisory council in San Francisco is working to build capacity for its collective impact projects. And the primary focus is on supporting the Stronger California legislation. It's my honor to introduce you now to Jessica Stender. She is the senior staff attorney at Equal Rights Advocates, who will share information about this important legislation, how you can support it, and what you can do to support relevant policy changes in your own city. I wanted to let you know that on the call today, we have people registered from 16 states. We have California, Colorado, Connecticut, Washington, DC, Florida, Hawaii, Illinois, Massachusetts, Maryland, Maine, New Mexico, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, and Washington. So welcome to everyone. Um, outside of California, and Jessica will be sure to help you to know why is it important what California is doing and how is it relevant to what can and will happen in your states as this Network City program goes. So, Jessica, thank you again for joining us today, and I am going to stop sharing my screen so that you can go ahead and share yours and introduce yourself to the uh, callers. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I think you should be able to see me now. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Hopefully you, Betsy, can you confirm that you're seeing a PowerPoint presentation? I am, and I just want to go up to the top and go to presenter view so that you 
go up to the right, um, just above California, where it says in the monitors box. Okay. Yeah, right. You're almost there. Look in the um, right. Let's see. Uh, there, to the right. Go to the right. Yeah, there, right there. It says use Perfect. present of you. I think that will work. Okay. So while we're waiting for this, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Jessica Stender. There, do you see it now? Yeah, Carrie, how are you seeing it? Or Kate, I'm seeing it still in uh, her view. You might need to change to a different screen that she is. You might need to select a different uh, screen, Jessica, for stop share. So I stop share and pick the screen that has only the slide and not your notes. Okay. Apologies, everyone, for the technical okay. difficulty. Okay, and actually, it's a perfect opportunity to say that um, with these virtual convenings, one of the reasons why um, we know women's organizing right now, um, you know, maybe is limited, is that we all need to practice our skills at these virtual online convenings, and um, and until you've done it a few times live, you never know what kind of little snafus come up. So. Um, all of us women know we don't have to be perfect, and um, and I'd say Jennifer or Jessica, we should just go with it as it is. Okay. We'll see you then. Okay. So. My name is Jessica Stender. I'm a senior staff attorney here at Equal Rights Advocates, and we are a, a national a nonprofit organization based in San Francisco, California. Um, and we do work at both the, at the local, state, and national level to improve um, and advance opportunities for women and girls. We do that in a variety of ways. We do some litigation, we do community education, uh, and we do um, policy advocacy. And one of the kind of main focuses of our policy advocacy is through the Stronger California Advocates Network that Betsy mentioned. So I am very sorry that you're going to see a not beautiful slideshow, um, but I'm going to not worry about that right now and get started. Let's see. Great. So. Okay, so um, the Stronger California Advocates Network kind of, we developed this network a couple years ago starting in 2015. And the idea was to come together uh, and bring advocates together from a variety of areas, recognizing the need to work to promote women's economic security and recognizing the need to address that issue from a kind of a uh, multi uh, uh, myriad appro approach and a multi uh, uh, intersectional and multi dimensional approach, and so we are. Let me go to this next slide. Um, a collaboration of groups from around California uh, with experience working on different issues that affect women. Uh, we call them our four pillars, and I'll go into those four pillars in a moment. But basically, we have groups who work in different but overlapping areas, um, and the idea is to improve the economic security of women and families throughout the state, and also serve an as an example for other states around the country. So we capitalize on the strengths of our members, uh, as well as a partnership with the Legislative Women's Caucus in Sacramento to advance budget policies, but also bills uh, to improve economic security for women and families. Okay, um, so the four pillars of our agenda, we center our legislative priorities around four pillars. And those pillars are promoting fair pay and job opportunities, so issues such as equal pay um, and getting women into higher paid um, occupations, such as the trades that are often uh, uh, male dominated and higher paid, um, ensuring access to affordable and stable childcare, promoting family friendly workplaces, so issues such as parental leave uh, and sick leave and, and family leave. And then finally, eradicating poverty, but also building assets. And that's a big kind of focus of our work that I wanna um, uh, mention, I'll speak more about that um, at the end, but kind of not just addressing poverty and, and income support needs, but also really helping women and families build assets, which um, we often are, are, many people are familiar with the wage gap, the income gap that women and particularly women of color face but the wealth gap um, or the asset gap is actually even greater and it's not as discussed. So um, first I wanted to kind of go into <laughs> why we uh, decided to do this and why in California and why focus on women. And so again, I'm sorry you're seeing all of my notes here. <laughs> um, let me just see if I can. 
Right, you're seeing the main screen, right, Betsy? Actually, so this is Carrie. So I would like to just take sure. a look if we can pause here. Um, yes. So that somebody can give you uh, a little bit of direction on, yeah. So if you share your screen, and, and actually I don't think you want to be in presentation, presenter mode. Um, I, I think that's actually what's what you're showing everyone now, which is not what you want to show everyone. So um, if you can, can anyone help Jessica with some directions on what buttons to press on her screen so that she can give folks the right? Yeah, Jessica, if you if you go to um, the slideshow tab on the top of on the you know the main screen of your PowerPoint, mm -hmm. presenter mode, um, you can go to presenter view there. I don't, at least on mine. Oh, is that what you were on? That's on mine. If I put on presenter view, then it will show me just the um, the slide and not the notes. That's what was causing the problem. Right. No, no, not not the checkbox that she clicked before. I might have a different version though, now that I'm looking at it. Um, let's Does see. someone else want to drive the presentation for Jessica from, from our side? Can we do that? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Okay, so. Here we go. Okay. So while they're um, figuring that out, and apologies to everyone for the technical difficulties, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of go into why we focused on women and why in California. Um, so women, and I'm hopeful these people, are people seeing the main slide now? Yes. Perfect. Great. Um, so some of these uh, these points on the current slide kind of indicate why we really focused on women and why in California. So California is home to 12% of the country's women. We comprise almost half of the workforce in the state. In 2015, more than half of working mothers were the, either the breadwinners or co-breadwinners in their family. Yet women in California continue to face obstacles to enjoying economically secure lives. And as we all know, this not only takes a toll on them, but also on their on their families. So we all, I think many people know, California is the sixth largest economy in the world, it was the eighth, it's now the sixth, um, but it has one of the nation, nation's highest poverty rates and this disproportionately affects women and children. So the reason we really focus on women is not only for the importance of, of, of improving women's economic security, but really the effects that this will have on their, on their families and communities throughout the state. Um, California. California has been a leader uh, in pushing for policy reform in many ways for you know years um, and has kind of been a leader in terms of policy reform on pay issues, on family leave issues, on other kinds of issues that are critical to women's economic security. So that's really kind of the reason why we decided to push for it in this state. We were inspired by uh, a, an action that the Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives um, introduced an agenda at the federal level uh, called When Women Succeed, America Succeeds. And that was an economic agenda for women and families at the federal level. So that was kind of our inspiration. Um, it was also a different time uh, when we started Stronger California. This was when President um, Barack Obama was in office. So we had a very different federal landscape. Uh, the president was kind of at the, at the um, helm, pushing for women's rights in many different ways, um, emphasizing the need to promote gender equality, addressing the wage gap through different um, initiatives and executive orders uh, related to promoting gender equity. So it was kind of in that context that we formed Stronger California and wanting to really push it at the state level. As we all know, we're in a very different federal landscape now, which makes our work even more important um, now that we're um, uh, kind of facing a new and, and different and more hostile uh, federal landscape. Um, also, the uh, you can hold that slide for one sec. The the agenda, the idea of coming together. We um, the, I want to give you a bit of an idea of the structure of Stronger California because I think it's important to know how we structure ourselves around our organization, but also around our bill priorities because I think it's really a model that's worked well here that can be replicated in in other states. So we the structure that we have kind of addresses the need for a comprehensive and and also intersectional approach to have this kind of collective impact that Betsy mentioned earlier. Um, so we have a round table of organizations from around the state, over 30 organizations who form our round table and really kind of shared leadership amongst ourselves that where we have people who lead on each pillar, 
So I mentioned those four pillars before, and you see two of them on the screen now, and I'll go through those again. But we have organizations that serve as the lead on each pillar, and they're really the eyes and ears on the ground, um, kind of listening to what their constituents and members need in the certain areas that they uh, focus on. So for instance, in the issue of fair pay, what are the issues that we need to address to really promote fair pay, address the wage gap, address the wealth gap? Uh, the family friendly workplaces our lead pillar um, pillar leads on that um, in that area basically come to us with their proposals of what their members need so the big proposal in the past two years has been family leave and parental leave so we really kind of utilize these shared leadership structure so that people and organizations can um, kind of find out what their members and what their people need and bring it to the table as a core issue that we can then focus on through our agenda through our four pillar agenda you can go. So um, the, the victories that we've had in the past two years have been substantial. We've kind of drawn on our collective power as organizations, but also through this partnership that I mentioned with the Women's Caucus to really kind of bring to the fore uh, this need for focusing on women and families um, and using our collective power. So we get people to come up from all areas of the state to come up for rallies and lobby days in Sacramento, to meet with legislators, to tell them why we need these policies to explain the real world kind of pressures that women and families are facing uh, that require real kind of clear policy action and reform. So some of the victories, I won't go through all of them, but some of the victories that we've had in the past um, are listed on this screen. So on the fair pay uh, pillar, a big one that we had was the Fair Pay Act, which amended our state Equal Pay Act to remove uh, some of the employer defense loopholes uh, and also to provide more protections for pay uh, transparency. So prohibit, prohibiting pay secrecy, which would you know, prohibit employers from requiring employees or prohibiting employees from speaking about pay, uh, which is often a reason, a kind of a perpetuator of the wage gap, that women aren't aware of what they're being paid and aren't aware that they're being paid less than, than their male counterparts. Um, we also were very successful last year with the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. Domestic workers are predominantly women, often immigrant women, uh, workers who are um, uh, often denied kind of fair wages and fair pay. So this Bill of Rights brought them permanent overtime protections, which is critical to their income security. We also got a minimum wage increase uh, for all workers, but given that women are the majority of, of minimum wage workers here in California and, and at the federal level, this is particularly important for women. Um, and then also some community, some uh, basic skills training. So trying to get women into higher paid occupations that they might not necessarily be steered into. So the uh, AB 2288 was a, a, a bill that will increase women's participation in pre-apprenticeship programs and apprenticeship programs, which are critical to getting women into the higher paid trades. Um, a, some of the family-friendly workplace uh, uh, victories that we've had relate to job protection, so giving better job protection to parents with childcare needs, so their employers cannot uh, retaliate against them for, for, for having to provide childcare, and then expanding our paid family leave program. So we are one of uh, only a handful of states that has any paid family leave at all, uh, and this bill that we passed last year will increase the amount of paid family leave benefits that workers are able to obtain when they're on leave to care for a sick family member or for a new child. So we can go to the next slide. Um, on the uh, child care uh, pillar, we've had uh, several wins in terms of funding for more child care slots, subsidized child care slots. And then finally, on the poverty and asset building pillar, um, we've had budget uh, wins. The kind of biggest and most exciting win was re repeal of a, a CalWORKS, which is our state welfare program rule that basically prohibited families that were already receiving welfare assistance, state welfare assistance, from receiving additional assistance for a new child if that child had been conceived um, not as a result of rape or incest or failure of certain uh, um, uh, reproductive uh, reproductive uh, choices. And so that was a kind of really regressive um, rule that affected you know, poor women, particularly women of color, and denied their children benefits when they needed it for kind of outdated ideas of, of who is entitled and who should receive um, these kinds of uh, benefits at the state level. So those give you a sense of, of the kind of victories that we've had thus far. Um, and now I'm gonna turn to our agenda this year 
so the 2017 agenda, I won't go through all the bills, um, but the, the, the full list is here and we will supply it to you via email as well after. But this agenda has several bills on each of our pillars that address kind of these myriad challenges that women and families face. And on the next slides, I'm gonna just go through a few highlights of, those, of some of those bills. So the fair pay and job opportunity pillar, um, the, the bill I'm gonna highlight on that one is a pay data transparency bill. So this bill, and you can go to the next slide, is AB 1209. And basically, as I mentioned before, uh, pay transparency or lack thereof is a major contributor to the wage gap uh, in that women often aren't aware of what they're being paid and aren't aware that they're being paid less than their male counterparts. So this bill would require businesses in California with more than 250 employees to publish figures about wage gaps, so to conduct an analysis of their companies and publish any gaps between men and women uh, by job classification, uh, either the mean, both the mean and the median pay gap, publish it on their website and report it to the Secretary of State. And as we all know, despite laws at the federal and state level prohibiting employers from paying employees the uh, different amounts for the same or substantially similar work, this pay gap really exists in almost every industry in California and at the federal level, and it costs women billions of dollars in the course of their lifetimes. So one kind of clear policy prescription in this area is increasing pay transparency. And we've seen that companies have, who have uh, voluntarily performed this type of wage gap analysis have identified wage gaps and taken actions to, uh, to close the gap. So Salesforce is an example, Gap, Several other uh, companies have voluntarily done these types of analyses and found it to be indicative of a pay gap and, and kind of spurred them to take action. So this is one really exciting initiative uh, that's modeled after a UK initiative, which would require these large companies to do this type of pay data analysis, uh, which has been critical to, to closing the wage gap. So you can go to the next. So the next pillar of family-friendly workplaces, the, the bill I want to highlight, and you know, I know a lot of people on this call are not in California, but the reason I want to go through some of the kind of substance of these bills is that these issues really are kind of issues that affect women and families across the board in other states and localities across the country. So not only do I want to talk later about how the kind of um, uh, uh, rep, how you can replicate the model of Stronger California and other states in terms of organization of this kind of co coordination and collaboration, but also even kind of at the substantive policy level, the types of policies we're pushing for, I think, can and should be also fought for in other states. So on the family-friendly workplaces pillar, the main uh, bill that we're focusing on this year is SB 63, and that has to do with new parent leave um, and allowing parents to take leave to bond with a new child. So as many of you may know, at the federal and state level in California and in many other states, only employers of 50 or more employees are required to provide their employees with unpaid but job protected leave to take care of a new baby. So I want to just emphasize this. This is not paid leave. This is unpaid but job protected, meaning that they cannot fire the employee for taking the leave to care for a new child and they have to replace them and give them their job back after that leave. So what this act would do would be to bring down that threshold number from 50 employees to 20. So it would require employers of 20 or more employees to provide up to 12 weeks of unpaid but job protected parental leave to an employee to care for a new child. Um, under current law, more than 40% of workers here lack that job protection and could actually be fired for taking a single day off to care for a new child. And that's also the law at the federal level. Um, and as you can see in terms of California, um, this would improve access to parental leave to up to millions more workers while it would only apply to 6% of businesses in California. So we're really excited to push this forward as it's kind of a very clear uh, pay, um, equity issue for, for workers that you should not be uh, dependent on the size of your employer to get this very kind of fundamental right to care for a new child. So you can go to the next slide. So on the, um, the child care pillar, we, the bill I want to highlight is AB 60, and what this bill would do is to update income guidelines for uh, parents to, to be eligible for subsidized child care. And child care, as I've said, um, or as, I, as with the other kind of policy areas that we work on, is really an issue that's across the board and across the country critical to women and families being able to uh, have income uh, economic security and that you need child care to work. So because of out 
outdated income guidelines that have not been raised in many, many years. Many parents can't afford, uh, can't, aren't qualified for uh, a subsidized childcare. Um, and now with the very important minimum wage increase that we have at the state level, many parents who really should be entitled to childcare will now be uneligible for it. So it's kind of an, un, an unintended consequence. So this would now raise those minimum guidelines so that parents who need that childcare, subsidized childcare will get it. And then finally, on the last pillar, um, eradicating poverty and building assets, I'm actually going to just highlight really quickly two bills. One has to do with the poverty piece and the other is with the building assets piece. And I think that's a really key uh, collaboration that we need to focus on in other states as well, um, which is AB 557 would protect um, domestic violence survivors who are on CalWORKs, the state welfare program, basically by requiring a county to waive any rule that could put an applicant or a recipient of CalWORKs benefits um, at risk if they're a present or past victim of abuse. Uh, if, that, if that program requirement will put them at risk of harm or unfairly penalize them, the county would have to waive that rule. Under the current law, it's an optional waiver and it's discretionary. Um, so, you know, many of the welfare recipients in California are uh, victims of domestic violence or past victims of domestic violence. And we really want to make sure that all domestic violence survivors receive uh, the waiver they need to keep themselves safe and provide the benefits that they need for them and their families to get them out of poverty while not putting them at further risk. Um, so that's kind of an example of the anti-poverty type address uh, uh, direction. And then the AB 1109 really goes to the asset building and preventing asset stripping, which is kind of a, a, an issue in, at the federal level as well in many, in many areas and many states. So this bill would put a cap on certain loans, um, on the APR percent of certain loans. So it, it would cap that APR um, for consumer loans between $2,500 and $10,000 at 24%. There's currently no APR limit on loans in this range, and really low-income families and, and people uh, rely on these kinds of loans often in times of dire financial um, needs, such as medical emergencies or loss of a house. And so borrowers, you know, unscrupulous borrowers really take advantage of that and, and, and charge up to triple-digit interest rates, which create these kinds of debt, debt tra traps. That are extremely difficult for families to to escape. So this kind of um, these kinds of bills that we're focusing on, the kind of asset building and preventing asset stripping, are really a big focus of our work to really address the wealth gap that women and especially women of color in California face. So I want to just talk a bit about the structure that I mentioned earlier and why we think this, this could be replicated um, uh, in other states. So as I mentioned, we kind of use our collective power and use our kind of individual expertise, you know, of our organizational members to bring to the table um, the needs of women and families and how we can all work together to, to, to promote policy reforms that address those needs. So as I said, we have a round table of organizations that uh, address different issues but overlapping issues that, that affect women and families. And we have uh, bi-weekly calls of our round table members where we discuss the bills on our agenda and what's needed, where they're at and what's needed. We have an email list where we send information out to our members about where the bills are at, what committees they'll be heard in, how organizations can take action to support those bills, such as sending in letters of support, making calls to legislators, if they are able to get to Sacramento, coming to a hearing to either testify or provide what we call a Me Too to show support of a bill. Um, and then, as I mentioned um, earlier in the call, we have events throughout the year in Sacramento. We bring people up on buses from around the state to uh, come to rallies, to do legislative visits and, and meet with legislators to explain why these issues are important to them and why these policy requirements really are uh, needed, sending in letters of support, participating in social media uh, campaigns, and then doing in-district visits. So we have, because we have representation around the state, we're able to kind of garner support from our organization's members to go meet with legislators in their offices. And this kind of collective action approach, I think, has been really critical to our success because it recognizes that all of our organizational members are working on our kind of specific uh, areas. So we don't have the bandwidth to uh, be involved at a, a really high level on all of these bills. But because we kind of share how organizations can be involved uh, in, in kind of less uh, work intensive ways, it really allows us all to be involved in areas that we might not be able to be kind of uh, on top of otherwise. 
Um, and then the, the partnership with the Women's Caucus has also been key. So the, the Legislative Women's Caucus is a um, has their own agenda, Stronger California agenda, which is slightly smaller than ours, than our advocates' agenda, but overlapping. And so we'll do joint press conferences, rallies with those legislative um, legislators to show that kind of joint collaboration between the advocates and the legislators. And that's been a really key piece to showing other legislators the need to focus on these issues, these women's, uh, women's issues and family issues. So finally, I wanted to just talk a bit about how you all can get involved. Uh, you can go to our website, strongercalifornia.org, and sign up to become a member of our um, email list, which you'll get um, emails about the bills, where they're at, and how you can support them. We'll have sample letters of support for you to send in if you're able to come up to Sacramento. We'd love to have you up there. Um, you can also, on the next slide, um, you can also email me if you would like your organization. Hmm, it's not the next slide, but I can tell you. Um, if you would like to your organization to join on as a network supporter, basically that is for organizations that aren't going to be on the round table because they might not work directly on these issues but want to support the, the network and our legislative agenda kind of more, more generally. And as the network supporter, you can still participate in any way that you or your members are able to do via social media, via sending in letter of support, or coming up to Sacramento with us. So that's kind of the overview. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and as I said earlier, I'll be sending out uh, information about how to get involved um, and about our legislative agenda so that you can hopefully become involved with our effort here in California. All right, great. Thank you so much, Jessica. And um, so now we'll go back to sharing my screen. And, um, and essentially, um, if you are interested in, just a second. Um, if you're interested in supporting this type of collective action in San Francisco or in Denver, where we're launching a second pilot city this month in Denver, visit the chat box now because there's a link there that can show you how you can get involved in either San Francisco and Denver. But if you're ready to participate in collective action in your city, but we haven't started a chapter there yet, we'd like to invite you to join the network and tell us which city you're in, then help us spread the word. Once we have a critical number of individual participants in your city, we can then launch a chapter there as well. So we'll send a follow-up email with a recording of the call today, as well as links to join the network and spread the word. For the remainder of the call, now we'll open it up for questions, and I know we already have some questions that have come in. Um, and we'll talk about collective impact, the Network City Program, the Stronger California legislation, or anything else that people ask. And Kate, do you want to explain to everyone about how to either raise their hand or we already have people typing questions in the Q&A box? Yes, hi everyone. Um, so basically there are two different ways that uh, you can ask questions today. Uh, if you'd prefer just to type in your question, you can go to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and just type it in and then we'll answer it live for you. Or if you'd prefer to um, either come on the line um, just either via video or just through your phone and just ask your question out loud, you can uh, raise your hand uh, at the bottom of your screen as well and then we'll promote you to be a panelist and you can ask your question verbally. Um, so it looks like right now we don't have any uh, hands. Oh, we have one hand raised uh, from Veronica. So we'll get you on, on the line right now, Veronica. Okay, I'll just take a second for her to become a panelist. And Kate, just making sure that you see that Peg Carlson Bowen has a question. Yes. Great, okay, great. Hi, Veronica. Awesome, okay, I, this is the first time using this kind of um, a tool. This is, first of all, wow, you guys are awesome. Um, I want you to know that uh, Myself and BP, I'm with the United Nations Association Boulder County, and um, I partner with uh, business professional woman Sharon Simmons, who's on this call. I know she's listening. And we created a Colorado um, Cities for CEDAW task force, and we have 15 nonprofits on there. And um, we are aware um, indirectly of the, um, the great conference that you're going to have in June. Um, in Denver, and I actually sent someone an email asking some questions about that. 
And not to, uh, I don't want to um, waste anybody else's time in asking questions. I'm not sure how many people have questions, but um, is there someone I can talk to about that? Because one thing I'm not sure if Reach Out has gone out to the, because we have nine cities listed on our website that we're working with. I'm sorry, 10, 10 um, mayors, cities. Um, and we have a resolution and one proclamation so far for cities for CEDAW. Um, and you got right. And what I want to make sure is, is that those those cities were reached out to regarding the conference. And I also noted that um, it looks like it's closed right now. And so I just wanted some guidance on that because we'd like to uh, promote that conference. We think that's a great op opportunity for us all to get together and network and come up with a, like you talked about, having a standardized plan moving forward you know, of, of, of what we're all behind and communicating with each other. Uh, but we're not, we, we weren't even reached out to. Um, so I just, I just want to um, see how we can, one, support those constituents getting there, and two, if you find out who you have reached out to at this point. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Veronica. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Um, yeah, we, so just for the rest of the callers to know, um, Veronica is referring to the Denver Gender Equity Summit in our two pilot cities, one in San Francisco, uh, which is supporting stronger California legislation, and in Denver, we're producing um, really the first ever Denver Gender Equity Summit in partnership with Mayor Hancock's Office of Women and Families. Kim Desmond is the head of that department. She's been very involved in the planning of this with the Denver Women's Commission and a whole cross-sector group of women and organizations in Denver. And just to reassure you, Veronica, we are in touch with the Cities for CEDAW folks in Denver. They've been attending the meetings, actually. And, um, and there's a longer history about Denver and Cities for CEDAW that um, it's probably not useful to go into right now, but I would love to talk to you further about it. But for others on the call, in case you don't know, Cities for CEDAW is the campaign to get cities to adopt an ordinance um, that essentially affirms the UN uh, Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And did I say that right, Veronica? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it, you just missed all forms to set uh, all forms of discrimination against women. And and so, like all forms of discrimination against women. David. Yeah, and what has happened is the UN um, had this um, CEDAW uh, resolution that was passed um, a long time ago, and the United States is one of the very few countries in the world that has not signed it, saying that we want to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women. So the Cities for CEDAW campaign is designed to enlist cities in our country to adopt the, um, the resolution, and, um, and it's an important part of women's organizing. So, um, so, any, so Jessica or Veronica, let's talk further about that. And then Kate, do you have other questions? We do. Um, we have a question from Peg. Uh, this is for Jessica. Uh, she asks, does it's a, it's a question about the timing of advocacy and she asks does ERA, ERA choose a particular stage in a bill's life cycle to boost advocacy? I sometimes hear that August is a prime time for CA legislator visits. Great, great question. Um, so we um, here in California and, and with Stronger California, we kind of determine our what our legislative agenda will have on it. So kind of what bills and or budget requests we will have on each of our pillars. And, um, and that kind of depends on what our kind of pillar lead organizations are really hearing from their people, from their members on the on the ground about what's needed. Um, and so we determine kind of our full agenda, depends, we have a two year legislative cycle here, but so it depends on which year of the two year cycle we're in. But generally by March, early April, we finalize our agenda. And we really start our advocacy efforts from the start. So the first kind of initial portion of the year, or once we, we kind of finalize our agenda, is really educating other legislators about about the need for the various policy reforms that we're pushing for. So we have lobby visits um, when we do a launch of our agenda, which we just had our launch this year on, on Equal Pay Day, April 4th, um, where we, we do a press conference to kind of announce our priorities. We have community members and advocates talking about why we need these policy reforms 
and why they're so important to their daily lives. Uh, and then we do legislative visits. And those kind of early advocacy visits are focused on, as I said, educating uh, legislators and their staffers about why these policy reforms are needed. And often, you know, we, I think, as advocates and all of you all as kind of women's rights advocates in your own way, I think we often forget that, that um, legislators don't always understand the need for parental leave or for childcare, um, or for these other issues that kind of come together to, to sometimes um, uh, provide obstacles or barriers to women um, achieving economic security. So in the early stages, it's really just one of educating. And then as we go throughout the process, we, we and our, our um, Stronger California members and supporters send in letters of support as they're going through committee hearings and sometimes testify. And then we have a generally a second lobby day in the summer, which is often after the first floor vote has happened, to then start getting it on the radio are of the second house members and then finally at the end of the year as you mentioned in your question that final push in august is really big because there most of our some of our bills have already been passed out of all you know voted through both houses and that pushes then for the governor and really pushing the governor to see this is an issue that matters to our people and the people all over the state this is why you need to sign this bill into law um, and then also for the kind of remaining bills that have not yet passed their second floor vote it's the final push to get legislators on board um, and just one quick example I'll give, the parental leave bill that I mentioned um, this year was actually a bill that we, a uh, priority bill of ours last year. It got through uh, both houses. Sadly, the governor vetoed it, which I won't go into the kind of reasons for that, but happy to talk with anyone else about that as kind of the kinds of challenges to these policies that you might face. But the kind of victory there was that we, because of our advocacy efforts, got even Republicans on board, uh, not only to vote for the bill and pass it out of the second house, but also to get up on the floor and talk about why it was so important for workers to have parental leave and why you know their family needed it or they themselves needed it. So our kind of advocacy efforts on that end were really to get people involved and get, get legislators to know why these were so important and why they should prioritize why these policies are so important why should they really should So Jessica, I just want to interject. I think it's really powerful to think about how a national um, and state and city-based network city program you know can build the numbers of women and allies, men as well, that are engaged in these issues and how they can then come in and be the support at these rallies or in letter writing or making sure that women in their community know about the legislation, writing letters to the editors. This is the kind of activism that gives uh, legislators and the governor you know, the, the wherewithal and the backbone to make the changes that need to happen. So I also wanted to just answer RJ Harrington has a question that says, you know, I imagine that the effort is nonpartisan, but if we're registered with a particular party, is it problematic to engage there with? Absolutely, we want people from both sides of the aisle. There's a lot of common ground in these bills, and so it's not a one side uh, against the other. So absolutely, RJ. And then someone else asked about, are we networking? Sharon, hi Sharon. Uh, Reggie uh, Maynard asked if are we networking with other groups including indivisible women and she knows of a major group in Nevada City, California and um, we are not yet uh, connected with indivisible women but yes the whole purpose is to build this network so that we are all networked together and that these kind of calls and activities support organizations in the network uh, like ERA, right? Or like Indivisible Women or Republican Women. So there's a there's a broad set of conversations that we need to be having as women across the network. And then, uh, Kate, I think there's one more question. There is. It was a follow-up to um, Peg's initial question for Jessica, um, just asking if, if uh, we could explain, uh, if she could explain more. Jessica, if you could explain more about the two-year legislative cycle and why is that? Sure. So um, we're now in the first year of that two-year cycle. And what that means is that some bills will become what they call two-year bills. Uh, so some bills will actually, you know, get through both of their, you know, both of their houses and, and be signed by the governor and, and, and be passed into law or, set, you know, hopefully not die in the first year. But some bills that take a little bit more work, um, may a legislator may decide to kind of hold the bill over, um, not bring it up in committee, and wait to bring it to the second year to kind of garner enough support among their colleagues. Um, and so that, I don't, I'm actually not familiar in terms of other states, whether that's 
whether that's replicated in other states, but it actually provides a great opportunity to help us build where bills are kind of a bit a bit more um, at risk to help us build more support at the community level to show legislators that we're here, that this bill matters, and that we're going to support the, them in, in pushing for it, even if it takes the kind of two-year process. Um, okay, so let's see. We have we have a couple of additional call or questions. Um, the first is uh, related to organizations. So I think I think probably both Betsy and Jessica could answer this in different ways um, for its time network and then equal rights advocates. So we have how can my organization get involved involved in the work that's happening in San Francisco? Um, so to get involved in with work in San Francisco right now, really it is to get behind this. Um, work with Stronger California and to stay connected and to keep joining the calls. As we build the network, um, we have to grow the network to build the capacity for collective action. So a really important thing is to invite at least 10 other women and allies in your network, to, in your network, to join this network, to say, you know, we're building a large community now of women and girls and allies and it's important to get involved and so that we can send out information across the network. So um, participate with other women and allies in our new Facebook group. So Kate, do you wanna tell them about the Calling All Women and Allies space? Yes, group? so so everyone who has uh, joined the call today or registered for the call today even, um, and anyone who has registered for a previous It's Time Network Calling All Women Virtual Convenings or any in the, in the future will be um, invited to join a private Facebook group uh, called Calling All Women and Allies in which you can continue the conversations that we're having here or talk about ways that you can um, you know, connect with one, one another or get involved in your city or uh, connect with others to start a network city chapter in your own city. Um, so in the follow-up email, where, when we send you all of the um, all of the materials that have been presented on this call, as well as links to joining um, the network and to learn more about the Stronger California legislation, we'll send you an invitation to the Facebook group. So um, keep a lookout for that in your inbox um, in the next couple of days. Great. Okay. Other questions? Or um, let's see. We don't have any other questions right now, but if, if anyone has additional questions, we'll give another uh, couple of uh, seconds just to, you can raise your hand or send it via the Q&A box. Um, okay. and, and while we're waiting, I'll just say that our next call, Kate, why don't we tell them about the call and the date and, um, and what's happening on our next call? Yes, um, our next call will be on May 16th, two weeks from today at the same time. Um, we'll be joined by Kim Desmond from, from Denver, uh, as Betsy talked, Betsy shared about her earlier. And we'll be talking about um, the Denver Gender Equity Summit, what the sort of, um, what, why we launched the Network City chapter in Denver and what we are hoping to accomplish through the Denver Gender Equity Summit and then in the months following um, in terms of, uh, policy change. So yeah, I'll just add a little bit there um, because it'll give you a sense of what's possible in your own city that's coming up as we build the network and we have participants that join the network in your city and we reach a critical mass of people in any given city. We start to build the local advisory council, then we can begin to have a convening with local representatives and roundtable events. So the Denver Gender Equity Summit is a very powerful roundtable event that we're doing, as we said, in partnership with the Mayor's Office on Women and Families. And we're going to be working on a common agenda for workplace policies and conditions, um, to improve workplace conditions, and also to improve women's economic security. And to begin that focus in Denver um, is an important piece of work for empowering women and girls. So, as a city comes online, we can then begin to facilitate this kind of activity in your city and engage the growing number of um, women leaders into a local advisory council, planning for these roundtable events, planning for um, an expo of women and girls organizations and other organizations working for gender equality, men are involved as well. And, um, and making the whole issue of gender equality much more visible in your community. So um, everything that you will be seeing on these calls are just examples of what can happen in your town. Okay, any other questions? Or what are, we, are we ready to wrap? I think we're all set. Okay, well, so 
Jessica, I just wanted to say thank you for all the work that you're doing. I know that all of you, um, you know, are working so hard at Equal Rights Advocates on behalf of women and girls. And, and we know for the men who are on the call, when women and girls thrive, our communities thrive, all of our family thrives. It's not just policies that are pro women it also benefits men and everyone across the gender spectrum so so anyway jessica thank you for your time and your energy and all of your commitment to the work that you do and thanks to the team thanks for uh, the call and uh, thank you to everyone for your time today and thank you for your patience with our techno glitches no matter how often we practice there's something that comes up at times so thank you so much and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next call and be sure to tell other people all right so thank you and have a great day.